Good morning, West Side. Let's stand up and worship together this morning. Hey, 
Turn to your neighbor this morning and tell them there is hope in the name of Jesus. What's up, church? Good morning. (laughs) I'm Ryan. I'm the worship leader here, and I have a few things to chat with you about before Casey jumps into his message. Hey, I want you to connect and grow with us. That's what we want to do. We want to connect with each other and grow, And, and one of those ways we can do that is if you're new with us, we have, or if you've been here for a while and you haven't downloaded the app yet, we have an app. Scan the QR code in front of you on the seat back in front of you, and download the Westside Leavenworth app. That's a great way to connect with us and grow with us as we are growing in God. And I want to tell you about a few things today. Tonight, I'm so excited, is a night of worship and prayer and dessert. So come hungry, bring a dessert to share with your friends, and uh, we're going to have a fun time tonight. Six o'clock, this room. I hope to see all of you here it's going to be just a fantastic night, and the worship team is in the back talking a little bit about it, and yeah, we're excited. Uh, something else is next week, we want you to connect and grow in our serve link, and this is where you can grow in your character and capacity to lead, and that's something we value here at Westside. And so during next week, during all the services, we're going to find places where you can plug in, and you can find a place to grow in, or you can serve in. And we grow in that character and capacity to lead by serving. We lead by serving. Next up is our kids gig. We can connect with the kids. Yeah, I'm pumped. Are you pumped? I see you back there, Stacy. She's pumped. (laughs) Uh, So coming up on July 29th is kids gig. If you haven't registered your kids yet for this, please do that. You can do that on the app or at westsideleavenworth.com slash kids gig. We want kids, but we also want adults to help out. And you can also register online for that. And that is going to help our kids grow in God when we connect with them. You see this connect and grow, how it's fluid through all of this? And the last thing I want to share with you is um, we are entering into our last leg of this unshakable journey. And it ends in December. And one of the ways we're, we're See, I took notes because I wanted to say this correctly. It's important to take notes. We want to share how your generosity is about to make an impact through sharing the gospel in one of the largest unsearched people groups, these people that have not heard the gospel before. And I'm just going to show you the video. It's going to better explain it. In Ethiopia, hundreds of thousands of refugees have fled from South Sudan, and they are 99% unreached. Westside has partnered with Faith Comes by Hearing, an organization equipping missionaries dedicated to spreading the word of God through audio boxes called Proclaimers. Because of your generosity, Westside has given $35,000 to purchase 223 proclaimers to be used in Ethiopia, ministering to South Sudanese refugees, helping share the gospel stories to people who have never heard about Jesus. This allows churches to be planted, disciples made, and releases God's unshakable love to a vulnerable population. We are on mission to share Jesus to the world around us, and your generosity has made an impact in the lives of so many in Ethiopia. Thank you, Westside. Yeah. How amazing. 
Thank you for your faithful generosity, Westside. It is, it's just beautiful to hear about these types of stories. And over 200 proclaimers, that's a big deal. That's, that's a lot of people that are going to hear the gospel proclaimed. Um, if you're new here with us and you're like, what is, why does he keep saying the word unshakable? Well, I invite you to find out on the app. Click the middle tab that says unshakable and find out more or go to unshakable dot faith and we invite you to join us on this journey this beautiful beautiful journey go ahead and get out your notes Just a minute. I've got to finish something. I'm working on something here. I'm working on a theory. Anecdotal. Um, actually, it's based on some ancillary evidence, but here's my working theory. Our culture is pu- pushing us pushing you, pushing me to become more individualized and isolated. At the same time, we lie to ourselves that we are connected. Think about this. We, I, or we are lying to ourselves that the methods to connect that we think you now connect in healthy relationships are effective. There are many demands on your time. There are many demands in your life, and there are many many demands in our lives that make our lives now so busy, and we're more busy than any other society has ever been in the history of humanity. Our days are filled with commitments that we don't have time now to relationally connect. We are so spread so thin, media, marketing and culture, your work, our, our companies, our, our, our drives, they, they push us to commit to more. We say yes to more and more things. Um, because we want to say yes to more things, we actually buy more things, which cause us to have to work more hours. And we give into this theory. <laughs> we give into the theory, or we give into another theory that that. We need to do what makes us happy. Maybe that's a theory you bought into. And so when you do just what makes you happy, when you do just that, what happens is you selfishly do more. You add more in your life. And then when we get home, we feel like this need to connect. And we feel this need to be connected with others. So what do we do? We pull out the portal to the only world in with with which we believe we can connect, a digital world. And we say we're connected because of this digital space. Unfortunately, and studies are proving this more and more, the unfortunate thing is that the effects of this digital space, it, the, the, the studies reveal that, that it is single-handedly, slowly eroding community. It is slowly eroding community while boasting at the same time it will build community. Social media has created more anxiety than than it has connection. And we need to be real about this. Pushing us to isolate ourselves even more. Get caught in behind a screen. And there are people right next to us sometimes if we're caught in this digital portal. And this honestly studies reveal, has impacted the female gender more than it's impacted the male gender. Um, However, online gaming, online gaming and online gambling has trapped men of all ages, pushing them away from being connected. Adult websites have trapped us into this, a false community. 
The result is that most of our meaningful connections, the ones that we would share with, that mean the most to us, we would say, those are the relationships that suffer the most. The relationship with our spouse suffers. The relationships with our kids suffer. The relationships with any true friend or once who may have been a true friend, that suffers. And our relationship with God suffers. And I think we need to ask ourselves a question. I think we all need to ask this. Are we being honest with ourselves? Really, are we being honest with ourselves? Do, it is wildly amazing to me the number of articles that have connected eating together as a keystone habit to the general well-being and happiness of someone. You ought to look it up. Not right now, but look it up, okay? <laughs> It's wild to me. And ironically, the keystone habit has been pushed out of the rhythm of our lives by the things that boast that they will connect us. And I think it's ironic that this is the one thing that is, should be a part of the church's rhythm that has distracted us from being impacting the people around us. So I want us to take a moment today, and I want you to be honest with yourself, and there's list in your notes, on the top of your notes, so get out your notes. I want you to ask yourselves honestly, when was the last time you shared a meal with your family? When's the last time you shared? And I'm not talking, uh, you know, at the meal and you're at, and everybody's like this, okay? The modern family meal, like everybody's got their devices together, we eat and we go. I'm talking when you shared a meal and there was no distractions on the table. When was the last time you shared? I want you to write it down. Was it last week? Was it yesterday? Was it three days ago? Write down the day if you remember. If you may not remember, just say, I don't know. Just be honest with yourself. Only you know this. When's the last time you did this with your family? When's the last time you did this with some close friends who follow Jesus? When's the last time you were with some friends who follow Jesus, some, the community of believers, and you had one or two other people or maybe another couple that's maybe a part of this church family or a part of the kingdom family of God, and you shared a meal with them? What about someone who was far from God? Or how about just someone new? Be honest with yourself. Write it down. And while you do that, allow me to introduce myself to those of you that don't, I don't know, and you may not know who I am. My name is Casey, and I am so grateful to be together with you today. Uh, we're going to talk more about this in a moment. And uh, for those of you who are new with us in the room, I'm so grateful that you're here. For those of you that are new with us online, we're so grateful to share this time and space with you wherever you are. Um, and it, it, for those of you that are new with us in the room, I want you to know that we have a gift for you, and we'd love to give you that gift right after today's service. So if you will, after today's service, uh, will you make your way through our lobby into our Welcome Center, which is located right across the hall there. In there, a host will be there, and they'd love to give you a gift for being with us today. And while you're there, will you just allow us to have four minutes of your time to share four things about who we are as a church family that we believe would be meaningful for you to know. Uh, for those of you that are new with us online, we'd love to send a gift to you. Uh, they're posting a link to a Connect card. Will you fill that link out? And we'd love to send a gift to you uh, for being with us today. Now, Westside, will you join me in welcoming everyone online and letting those new in the room know how grateful we are to share this time with them? Will you do that? Yeah. So we're in the middle of a series of messages where we're looking at how the disciples of Jesus are called to join Jesus in his mission to change the world. A mission that Jesus had that has transformed the world and turned the world upside down. And in this series, this has been the series big idea that we're looking at, so get out your notes, write this in. I am called, you are called into Jesus' mission to bless everyone, everywhere, by being a disciple who makes disciples. We are called to bless everyone and everywhere because this is what Jesus was called to do. Over the last several weeks, we have identified that sin has broken the blessing of God on humanity. Sin is the, it has broken, and therefore the brokenness in our world, the brokenness in our humanity is the result of what sin has done. And since Adam and Eve sinned, the enemy of humanity has seeded, constantly seeded deceitful ideas that play to our disordered desires to be normalized in a sinful society and thus destroying the blessing of being connected in a relationship with God and being connected in relationship with one another. But God had a plan 
to restore humanity's connection with him and restore our connection with one another. In Galatians 3, the Apostle Paul, we looked at uh, in the last couple of weeks, the Apostle Paul identifies that Jesus is the promised blessing God promised to Abraham that would bless all nations of all people, everyone everywhere. See, God sent Jesus into this world to bless everyone, everywhere. Jesus, he is the blessing to all nations, all tongues, all tribes, at every point of the world, everyone, everywhere. And whoever has faith in Jesus, whoever receives Jesus as their Savior, confessing Him as their Lord, now experiences the blessing of having the Holy Spirit come into their life, making them alive in Jesus, making them now a part of a brand new family, the new humanity of God. And God thus has restored them and reconnected them into a relationship with God. And now we live out of this relationship with God and we experience beautiful relationships with one another. This is what God has called us into. This is the blessing. This is God's work through Christ Jesus for you and for me. This is the blessing Jesus is to everyone everywhere. And when, when, when Jesus was here on this mission, he called his disciples, the church, mind you, to join him in this mission. Jesus sends the church out on his mission to expand his kingdom of God by making disciples who make disciples. And that's what the disciples were commissioned to do. What they were commissioned to, they committed to. They committed to do what they were commissioned to do. Go into all the world baptizing people in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything Jesus commanded them. That's what they did. The church, think about this. Just in the name, the church, ecclesia is what the original Greek was and it unfortunately got interpreted as the church in the German translation of this and we have thus since thought it was a building but it was not a building in Jesus' mind. The church, the ecclesia is a gathering. The coming together. The church is a gathering of believers together on Jesus' mission. And the church, the gathering... In a world that wants us to be more isolated, more disconnected, we must remember that we are God's gathering. A picture to the world of what the new humanity is to be. And the hope of what humanity will one day be. And see, something powerful happened when the first century church gathered together on Jesus' mission. And we talk about this regularly. This is important to our DNA as a church. We read about this in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that these early church goers in the first century, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is what the, the first century church looked like and what they did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to, look at this, the fellowship, the gathering together to share things in common and, and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone, we read, was filled with all at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, I want you to do something in your notes or in your Bible. Will you circle or underline or highlight somehow the words ate together ate together eating is referenced three times in these five verses repeated three times in five verses they were devoted to the breaking of bread which represented this passover meal that jesus transformed and he the the people this jewish culture saw the passover differently because he changed the meaning of the passover And this regular routine of doing this. And he incorporated it in a daily rhythm of sharing a meal together. And they broke bread in their homes, we read. And then they ate together. We see this three times in five verses. And I want you to think about that. And while you think about that, 
I want to ask you the question that I asked last week. How did the Lord add to their number daily those who are being saved? How did God do this? Well, people, did people far from God just show up on their doorsteps? Did people who are far, like kind of like what we think today, that people are just going to arrive at our church building who need Jesus? Do we think that is the way that God adds to the number? Well, I believe the disciples' daily devotion is what led them into this daily practice. And it's through that God worked. See, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. And the apostles taught everything to others that Jesus had taught them. See, write this in your notes. The Lord added to their number daily as the disciples, write this in, obeyed. As the disciples obeyed Jesus' command to go and make disciples. So we got to ask, how did they do this? How did they go and make disciples? Well, it's my belief that the early church practiced rhythms, rhythms of mission and rhythms of discipleship that Jesus would teach them. And I believe he established these in Luke chapter 10, a a passage of scripture that we've been camping in and we're gonna remain camped in for the next two weeks as well. In Luke 10, Jesus prepared the disciples for the mission he was going to put into their hands. He was gonna pass the baton off to them and they were going to do this. And because they would be faithful to this rhythm and implement this rhythm in their daily life, through that, God would change the world. Through the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, because of the work of Christ. A mission to expand the kingdom of God and see people far from God, (laughs) all over the world, receive the blessing of salvation that comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is what we read in Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go! I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone along the road. To which we think, man, that is the greatest way to encourage your people to go, Jesus. Lambs like wool in the wolves? I mean, this is kind of a risk. But there's something powerful in sharing a risk together. And in week one, we talked about the first missional disciple-making rhythm. Something that we, we breathe in and we breathe out. And where there's, some, there's things about the rhythm of the kingdom of God, things that we take in and things that we engage in. And in week one, we talked about this blessed rhythm. And, and this idea of bless, we use the acronym bless to help us see the rhythm and the disciplines and the di- disciple-making rhythms that Jesus would teach in Luke chapter 10. And the B of this disciple-making rhythm is to begin in prayer. And we begin in prayer, and we ask you to begin praying a new way, or a, a, a way that we actually been, have taught many times, and we just ask you to continue this. And we breathe in, God, where are you at work? We ask that question. We receive, God, where are you at work? And we listen to him. And then what we do is we exhale and we say, how can I join you there? God, where are your work? And then how can I join you there? I hope you continue to pray this. I hope that every day you pray this. I hope when you enter a new environment and there are people around you and praying this, God, where are your work in this room? How can I join you there? We breathe in this rhythm. In next verse 5, Jesus instructs his disciples. We talked about this last week. He instructs them, when you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there. (laughs) We talked a lot about this last week. In fact, go back to our app or online to watch any of these messages because you can learn more about these practices. And last week, we discovered the simple and powerful missional disciple-making rhythm of listening and engaging. And that's what the L is. Listen and engage. Listen to the questions and engage in a relationship with the person of peace. Now, we identified what a person of peace is. A person of peace is someone who welcomes you into their story by sharing a part of their story with you. In that day and age, Jesus said, if someone welcomes you into their home, stay there. Well, we all know that that doesn't ha- happen as often. You know, we don't leverage the home in our today's culture. It's a very private space. We're not a very communal culture like the Hebrew people were. This is a way different culture. But people will welcome you into their story. And when someone welcomes you into your story, that's a person which you listen to their story. You, you breathe that in. And now you engage in relationship. And you stay there. 
Those are the people with whom you must engage in building a relationship. These are the people that, that, that are sharing their part of the story and in fact welcome you, welcoming you into their life. And the person of peace is a gatekeeper to the larger community who needs the gospel of Jesus and they may be the connecting point to many others in their household or in their neighborhood or in a specific community who need to hear the gospel of Jesus. These are the people with whom we must engage in building relationships. The person of peace is the one. And this week, we're going to focus on the next instruction that Jesus says in verse 7. He says, stay there. And then this is what he does tell us to do with those we're engaging in relationship. Eat, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. So, Today's teaching big idea is powerful. It's a powerful idea. It is Jesus' strategy to bring the blessing of the gospel of his kingdom to a disconnected, hopeless world. It is the strategy to bless a world who is far from God, a strategy to bless a world who needs healing, a strategy to bring division and let that cease and bring unity. It is God's strategy to change the world and change it once again. It is the strategy to bless a world who needs Jesus. It's Jesus' methodology to bring healing to the broken community, to the marginalized. It's his hope for the hungry. It's the way to bring freedom to the worried and the good news of the gospel to those he came to save. It's his strategy to build up the body of Christ and continue to encourage and and resource and challenge the body of Christ to become more like him. The simple ancient practice may be a discipline that we need to revive in our households, in our lifestyles, And join Jesus, in order to join Jesus on his mission to change the world by changing someone's story. And this is the teaching big idea. Eat together. Simple. Eat together. This was Jesus' instruction to those whom he would train and send off to turn the world upside down. He would say, eat with those who I'm sending you to. Eat whatever they put in front of you. You know, there's something powerful about allowing someone to serve you a meal and you share that table with them. There's something powerful about you serving a meal and letting that person share that table with you. Think about this. Jesus Jesus is the creative intelligence behind all things that were created, John says. (laughs) And in this, he knows he embedded in the DNA of our humanity a need to eat, not just that we have this physical need to eat, but there is a spiritual and emotional need that we have to eat together. Jesus, the reason for everything created, knew the reason he told the disciples to eat together. And this is what I believe that reason is. See, eating together establishes a bond with one another. There's something unique and powerful that happens around a shared meal that doesn't happen in any other social gathering. This is why I think Jesus leveraged meals as often as he could. This is why I also think the Gospels describe how Jesus would leverage the meal in his ministry. This is why I think the Gospels are not just filled with what Jesus taught and the doctrine of Jesus. It it shows us how Jesus lived his life and much of his life was around a meal. The Gospels described how Jesus ministered around meals. See, Jesus did much of his ministry around a meal. Luke, the gospel writer and the author of Acts, focuses on this. And approximately one-fifth of the sentences in Luke's gospel and his writing of the gospel of Acts, meals play a conspicuous role. You can research this later, but allow me to share with you and sum up the two groups of people Jesus would use the meal to be a be a ministry to these people two groups of people first jesus ate with his disciples jesus ate with his disciples 
Jesus shared many meals with his disciples. He ate with those in his inner circle. Much of the Hebrew culture is around a meal. And you can look at that, throw out scripture, but Jesus leveraged this, this, this rhythm, this daily rhythm and this daily need to share his teachings and build up his kingdom, build up the disciples in his kingdom. In Luke 10, we see Jesus sharing a meal with Mary and Martha where, where he would teach them and teach the, the disciples as a whole. In Luke 22, Jesus would just share the Passover meal a meal that was shared in this culture and he would take this and right before Jesus would be betrayed and murdered, Jesus would use this meal to demonstrate the new way that his disciples would be known. They would be known by how they demonstrate their love for one another. And he would teach this around a meal. (laughs) Jesus shared two meals after the resurrection After his resurrection, he brought his disciples together. And look at, just think about this. In these two meals, Jesus, we are told, tied everything together. He connected all the scripture together for the disciples. He did this around a meal. He tied how he is the fulfillment of all the prophecies. He let them know how he is threaded throughout all of us, all around the meal. See, Jesus ate together with those inside the faith. He ate together with what he would call, and he would identify as his church, the disciples of Jesus. His family, the kingdom family, this was his family. Also, Jesus ate together with those who were far from God. Jesus ate with those who were far from God. Here's the mind-boggling thing about Jesus. Those the religious would not relate with, Jesus ate with. Think about this. The Gospels are filled with people that, 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 that would not relate. Jesus, religious would not relate with them. They were outcasts, outsiders. But Jesus would eat with them. Levi, a tax collector. One whom society rejected and labeled as the worst of the worst. Levi was a young man that you would never want your daughter to date. Serious. You have, like in our day and age, you have, you, you have people that do awful things. It's like these are, the, 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 in that culture, the Levi, the, the, the tax collector was the bottom of the barrel and Levi was that. Levi probably had to throw parties because nobody would ever invite him to the party. And Jesus audaciously invites Levi to follow him, extends a invitation to him. And after being invited, Levi throws a great banquet where Jesus shares the good news of his kingdom. Levi, we also know as Matthew, who gives us the gospel of Matthew. Then we have Jesus inviting himself over to another tax collector's home. This time, he invites himself over. I mean, you want to talk about Jesus being bold and audacious? He's like, okay, little man in the tree, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house for dinner today. This prestigious tax collector hears Jesus' words at this dinner that Zacchaeus now throws because Jesus invited himself over. Jesus is there teaching, and in this teaching, Zacchaeus is convicted. He repents. His whole household repents, a radical repentance. They begin to follow Jesus. (laughs) Jesus leveraged the table. And those who were unlike Jesus liked eating with Jesus because Jesus liked eating being with them. Jesus leveraged the table to share the most powerful message, the gospel of the kingdom, a gospel that has the power to save everyone who believes. Jesus ate with those the religious experts saw as outsiders. He ate with those that were outcasts. He ate with the rich rich aristocrats, yes, and he ate with the poor outcasts. And Jesus would even invite these two together at the table. He he would welcome them together at the same table. Jesus would leverage the table to show that there is a place for all people of all classes, of all ethnicities, that there's no difference between rich or poor, there's no difference between one race or another, that they're all welcomed at the same table. And Jesus used the meal to demonstrate that no one is unwelcomed in his kingdom. Jesus would be invited to a dinner. His name was Simon the Pharisee. He would be at Simon the Pharisee's house with all these other religious aristocrats. 
and a sinful woman who would be society's outcast. A sinful woman shows up uninvited, mind you, makes her way to the dinner table, makes her way to the table, and Jesus does the unthinkable. As she comes to his feet, weeping, allowing her tears to pull, pull on his feet, taking her own hair and cleaning off all the dirt of the day off Jesus' feet with her own glory of her own hair. She would take a year's worth of wage that was represented now in this bottle of perfume, something she worked so hard and cost so much, not just to her in a financial way, but it cost so much because of what she had to allow her body to be put through to make this money. And she would break it on his feet, anointing his feet. And Jesus does not reject her at this table and kick her out. He accepts her gift that she gives from her gratitude, an expression of gratitude for how much Jesus has forgiven her. See, the table was a place of forgiveness, a place of acceptance. The table, it was at the table, Jesus welcomed those who were nothing like him. Jesus welcomed those who felt like they had no place at that table. Jesus would use it and say, you have a place here. And the bottom line is Jesus ate together with those He came to save by transforming them and bringing them into the kingdom of God. See, he ate together with his church to build up his church. And he ate with those who are far from God to let them know that his kingdom is a table prepared for them. So how do we, in today's culture, hundreds and thousands of years removed from that culture, implement this powerful rhythm into our lives again? And see God do something powerful in us and through us, just like he did in the first century. But we must regularly practice this E in this missional disciple-making rhythm that Jesus teaches us to do. We must eat together. See, the missional disciple rhythm that we need to use to build up the body of Christ and this disciple-making rhythm to invite others to the kingdom of God, we need to eat together. And just like the other rhythms have have something we receive and something we give, we need to eat. And the way we do this is we need to eat and share meals with those first who follow Jesus. And this is how we breathe in that kingdom of God. And then we need to share meals with those who are far from God. It's simple. But our lives have made this so complicated. We need to eat with followers of Jesus, regularly eat with followers of Jesus. It's how we're going to grow in the faith and we're going to encourage others to and challenge others to grow in their faith. And we need to also eat with those who are far from God. What could happen in your life if you just began to regularly share a meal? Share a meal. What would it look like? I mean, for some of us, um, what would it look like for you to regularly share a meal with people in, who follow Jesus? What would it look like for you to share a meal with people who fo- are followers of Jesus? When you share a meal with followers of Jesus, you're going to be impacted by how they follow Jesus, how, 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 how God, they trust Jesus in the hard things of life, how they put him in his scripture into practice. You'll be challenged and encouraged by their story. And they can challenge you to follow Jesus. And they can do, hearing, having your kids hear their stories is a powerful way to grow in your own faith. And when you share your story around a table with another Christ follower, your story will encourage somebody else and challenge them to follow Jesus. What could happen in your home if you regularly shared a meal? I mean, what, let's just think about our spouse. What would happen if we just regularly made a couple times a month to share a, a, a meal with our spouse and kids and use it to talk about the things that happened in the day? You could leverage that to encourage your family to follow Jesus and trust in him. What could happen if you regularly shared a meal to show that you accept one another? What if you did this with your spouse? I'm, let's just go back to that. What, what if you did this with your spouse to show your spouse that you accept them, that you don't hold anything against them? <laughs> they don't have to live up to any expectation. You just, it's a place. And you encouraged one another. And you challenged each other to follow Jesus. What, Casey, a date? 
Yeah, a date. Imagine that. A date. I mean, what would happen if we began to revive the table? What would happen if we could just clear off all the things <laughs> that have collected on our table, that have impacted our schedule, that are distractions, that keep us from engaging, that keep us from engaging and building the relationships, the most meaningful relationships to us, and we could do it around a meal. What about those, and I'm just going to get real with you, okay? What about those unnecessary sports? Don't go there, Casey. You don't know what this means to my kid's future. You don't know what this means because if, if my kid doesn't get a scholarship, if my kid doesn't, if my kid doesn't do that, did, can I just be honest with you? You know the stats. You know how many scholarships are available from schools. And you know how much money you spend and how much time that costs your child. I'm not saying don't get involved in sports. My kids play sports. I coach a team. We make this probably the most practical way that it can empower family life. And that's why I coach the, and, and, I, and I try to do my best. But we also encourage our kids only one sport at a time because we value this space. I know your house isn't perfect. And, and, and many of us have this excuse that, man, all the chores got to be done before I invite somebody over. I mean, am I the only one that does this? I mean, don't look at my closet when you come over for dinner. <laughs> but what if we cleared the table and said, you know what? It's okay if the laundry's not done. It's okay if it's not dusted. Because what can happen here is more important than what we do there. What about your work? Man, can I tell you something? Your job's always going to ask you to do more. That's what your job is going to always do. It's always going to ask for more. Your work is a monster. And it wants to eat everything, including you. What if you chose to cheat your work and not cheat your family? What if you chose to cheat your work and not cheat your faith? What if you chose to allow those demands just to be set aside and do it? The kingdom of God is more important what God can do around those relationships is more important. What, what, okay, so let me just get real. What about the online gaming for those of us that are caught in the online gaming world? And, and I'll be honest, this is just as much, and in fact, it's more men than it is teenagers. And men, I'm going to just get up in our grill right now. There are more people, and there's so much time that we spend, some of us spend in this world or this world. And it's costing us this world. Let's move the distractions away. Let's put them down. I know your social media is an important thing and you got an, you got an online brand. But what if we, got this, we, we took away the distractions and we said, you know what? There's a limit, set a limit on your screen and own that limit. Be reasonable. I know you're a social media influencer, you got this big dream, but can I tell you something? The most influence that you can have in your house might be within your house or the people where you live, work, study, and play than an online world. The greater influence that you could have is for the kingdom of God. And I'm not saying that's not important, I'm just saying maybe this is more important. What if you could do that? I, you know what, here, we, we all got house projects, man, I get it. But what if we just said no to a house project and said yes to gathering together? What if we said no to our agendas and we just said yes to gathering together? And what if we could just do this and invite somebody over, invite our family over to eat together? Eat together with those in the faith and allow this rhythm of life to create conversations and opportunities that can empower our own faith and build up the faith of others and invite somebody into a faith that could transform their life. This is why I believe groups are such a powerful part of our spiritual growth. And in, a, in next month, 
we're going to be telling you and we're going to have group link for you to connect in a group and i want you to think about this now maybe you need to open your home to a group and you can share a meal and grow in faith together with other believers we need to redeem the table and see it the way Jesus saw it. And, and then we can use it the way Jesus used it. Because only when we see the table the way Jesus saw the table will we use the table the way Jesus used the table. Revival begins here. It begins here. See, the table is a symbol of community. And it creates a special bond among those there. It's a symbol that represents the community of faith, the new humanity of what Christ has established in us. See, Jesus is this one that brings us together. We are the common bond together. It's a symbol that Jesus wants to, us to utilize to create the community he wants to create, a community that has a bond that's centered on his work for us. That we all have something in common together. We all need Jesus no one, not one of us is, are perfect. You know, there's something beautiful about having, welcoming somebody into your house and your house isn't perfect. You know what? You think, oh my goodness, they're just like me. Not perfect. There's something powerful about that message. It's a symbol. In his book, The Anxious Generation, Jonathan Haidt writes this. He says, perhaps the most embodied activity that binds people together is eating. People who break bread together have a bond. The simple act of eating together, especially from the same plate or serving dish, strengthens that bond and reduces the likelihood of conflict. I want to tell you something about Jonathan Haidt. He is an atheist. Unashamed atheist. He quotes scripture, he quotes the practices of Jesus. An unashamed atheist. And he's using science to show you and I something that Jesus modeled for us. I don't recommend everything in his book, but I recommend this book to read. (laughs) See, there's power of a shared table that binds us together. So put the phones down, the games away. And can we engage in the meal? See, a place at the table is a place where you are accepted. And being accepted is the good news of Jesus. It's the good news. Of Jesus. And can I tell you something that I'm even learning even more and more? See, the table is a place where people can find healing and comfort. A shared meal with others will build trust with one another. And when you have the trust of the people around the table, you can share your hurts and your heartaches. And at the table, the God, the God, (laughs) through his people will comfort and he can bring peace through the words and the presence of those at the table. It's a place where you're accepted even though you're not perfect. At the table, you can be broken and experience the wholeness and peace of God. At the table, you are significant even though you have imperfections. You're wanted even though you're broken. And at the table, you are family even though at one time you may have been an enemy. It's a table. And we need to regularly do this. This is why Paul said, accept one another just as in Christ. God accepted you just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. See, there's a powerful bond when we eat together. And this is beautiful. And so this is what I want you to ask. Maybe you need to discuss this later. When can you have your next shared meal? And who will you invite? When is it? Talk about this. And while you talk about it, I encourage you to go to Uh, blesseveryhome.com. Download that app. Sign up to be a light. Because here's the thing. Look for our church and we can be a force in our neighborhood. I'm I'm serious about this. This app allows you to track the neighbors in your community who you are taking these steps with. Maybe, maybe there's an opportunity you've had to listen to a neighbor. You can type in their story. Maybe you've had a chance to eat with a, a family. You invited them over. You can type it in. Hey, we, we ate together on this date. You can track it. And today, I just want us to end. We're going to sing in a second, but I want us to pray, and I want us, you to pray with one another. And this is the prayer I want you to pray. Father, show my friend, show my spouse, show us where you are at work, and how to use this table to join you there. 
So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Get it together in groups of two or three. And will you pray with one another? Then we're going to take some time and we're going to sing together as we close off. Will you pray this prayer for one another? And let's see where God leads us as a church family. Go ahead, find one another and pray. To those around 
sing it out, church. prepared to give today uh, first of all thank you thank you for your generosity and uh, but also our ushers will now be making their way forward
she's running after, she's running after me. Your goodness is running after, she's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. faithful. The table is a way that we can share the story of his faithfulness to us. We're going to talk more about this. Don't miss next week as we continue this series, Everyone Everywhere. Also, I invite you to come back next Sunday as we practice this. It's not necessarily a dinner, but it is dessert. My not make it dinner, right? So let's sing together. We'll worship together and we'll have some time to build community after that around the table of sweets. And so we'll see you tonight. Also, our prayer partners are available. They love to pray with anyone for any reason. God bless you, Westside. We'll see you next Sunday.